You guys are like super far back, which is good. I had a lot of onions on that salad, so I wouldn't want to knock anyone out. Okay, um, so I decided to give you guys kind of an abridged version of a presentation that I'm going to be doing for uh, a convention coming up. It's for design for uh, EMS and, and emergency room personnel. It's called ClinCon. They do it every year in Orlando. So this is actually a, a presentation that I submitted uh, and got approved. So this is kind of the the uh, kind of a shortened version because again, you guys probably don't want to be here for a whole hour with me. You got had three hours of farm already this week. You guys are done, right? This is Friday. So this is a short, short and sweet version, um, but it's called Picking Your Patient's Nose. Should that ever be appropriate? No. Yeah, foreign bodies, that may be a good one. Yeah, absolutely. Fortunately, I've not had anything stuck up my kids' noses yet, but I'm waiting for it. One day, it's going to happen. But anywho, um, so this is about intranasal drug administration, and specifically in the pre-hospital setting. So who is that going to be appropriate for? What drugs are most appropriate for this sort of thing? Like, how, When should you decide to pick your patient's nose uh, in, in a drug sense? So, um, here are a couple of objectives we'll cover. I'm not going to belabor these points. I have no financial disclosures. However, if anyone would like to give me some financial backing, my YouTube channel's not doing that great, so whatever. Anywho. All right. So to state the problem, is it always feasible, is it always easy to get IV access on a patient, especially in the pre-hospital setting? So anyone, uh, uh, EMS personnel, paramedic, EMT? Right, so we got a few in the room. How easy is it to get IV access, or is it always easy to get it in the pre-hospital setting? No, right? So imagine you have someone who's seizing actively. Imagine you have a combative patient who's uh, perhaps is, you know, partaken of some bath salts or something similar recently. Um, or children. Children can be very difficult as well just from a, a physical standpoint. And also they can be kind of squirming on you and things like that. It can be difficult, right? Um, you can use the intramuscular route in a lot of cases. Uh, however, that is not going to be without any issues. You can see uh, patients have some significant needle phobias. They may be very uh, hesitant to utilize uh, the intramuscular route. It's painful. Uh, more so than uh, some of these other administration routes we'll see here. Um, and it can actually be er pretty erratic in some cases. You may have kind of unpredictable absorption of these medications, which is uh, not going to be the ideal situation. So we're going to see some other routes that we can use uh, to get around this issue. And also, you have to think about these patients, uh, you know, IV drug abusers and other kind of high-risk patients. There is risk for uh, infection spreading, you know, the HIV, hepatitis, things like that. You know, certainly healthcare providers can be at risk as well, especially if you're dealing with a combative patient who's moving on you and you accidentally stick yourself with a needle. We want to be able to, uh, to avoid that if possible. And so what's the solution? We can use the nose. Look at this lovely just vascular mucosal tissue just ready to have drug being absorbed very quickly through it very good and so the benefits of this is it's going to be relatively painless we'll see the device we're going to use uh no needles involved with this is very very easy to administer these medications um it has a very fast onset of action because the nose is so vascular the drugs can absorb very easily and they can get circulated into the systemic circulation and then to the CNS where the majority of the drugs we're going to be talking about here are going to be CNS active drugs. Um, so that's great. And then the other thing is it's going to be very easy to train lay people and then first responders on how to use this. So for instance, if you have, uh, say, a 911 call, um, is it always the EMT is going to be the first people to show up? No, sometimes police show up first. Imagine if police could be uh, able to administer a life-saving medication prior to the uh, EMTs getting there. That, you know, time is tissue in a lot of these cases. That can be very beneficial. You could train people who have no medical background on how to administer some of these medications that could potentially save lives. So we'll look at some examples of that in just a moment here. Um, and we already use a lot of intranasal medications to begin with. We have intranasal uh, corticosteroids used for allergic rhinitis. We have vaccines. So again, we're in the flu apocalypse, as Dr. Nicholson said. We have, you know, the, uh, the flu mist that we can administer uh, intranasally, and a lot of migraine treatments, things like, you know, Imitrex and, and drugs like that. So this is not a new thing, but some of the medications that we're using uh, via this route are a little bit novel. And so how does it work? Basically, we're going to have uh, a lot of these medications being drawn up into a syringe, and it will go through this, uh, what we call an atomizing device. Uh, not an ADAMizing device, but an ATOM uh, device. And so we, the most traditional one they have is called the MAD device, which is a mucosal atomizing device. And so you can see here it's a very fine spray uh, that uh, gets emitted from the, the end of the syringe. And notice here this is a nice padded – I should probably get the – you can see the laser pointer. You see this nice uh, little padded uh, bit of foam that actually will be inserted directly into the nostril, and then you just apply the medication directly uh, to the nasal mucosa. So it's very, very easy, and again, no needles, which is uh, beneficial. So um, once you apply the medication, it gets absorbed very quickly. And the other big thing is it gets to bypass one of our uh, favorite organs that likes to chew up drugs, namely 
deliver. We bypass first pass effect, which is another big thing. Buy availability is higher than it would be if you were to, you know, say administer these orally. Uh, so that's kind of another benefit. And it's going to get, uh, you know, circulated to the heart, back to the brain very, very quickly. So you can see, you know, pretty fast onset of action for many of these medications here. And again, typically what you're going to do is you're going to be dividing this dose uh, between the two nostrils. So say if your total volume of drug you're going to administer is one ml, you just basically divide it in half and kind of give a spritz on each side. Um, and we'll see some drawbacks to this. Obviously, this is not going to be a perfect system. So, and again, just another kind of diagram showing that once the drug is administered um, into the nasal cavity, you'll have some drug that gets actually directly absorbed straight to the CNS just due to the local proximity, which is beneficial. However, some, uh, most of it's going to go into systemic circulation and then up into the CNS. So you can get a little bit of direct action, but most of it has to go through the heart back to the brain. So some drawbacks. Why might not this be a good option for every drug? Well, a lot of it goes back to the physiochemical properties of the medication. So it doesn't work for everything. So as you uh, are very well aware of the, some of the things that make it easy for drugs to cross these biological membranes, drugs need to be lipophilic. They need to be able to cross there. If they're very hydrophilic, they're not going to be able to cross very easily. Um, they need to be relatively small molecules. They can't be charged at physiologic pHs. These are all things we've kind of covered before, but these go uh, hand in hand for these type of, uh, of administration. So that's really an important thing to consider there. The other big thing is that volume is really going to limit how much we can give with this. Giving much more than uh, one ml per nostril, you're gonna run into some issues. Again, you only have so much nasal mucosa. So a lot of that will either have runoff down the back of the patient's throat or kind of uh, dribble down you know, the outside of their nose. And so you're not gonna really absorb any of that drug at that point. And so because you're limited to one ml per nostril, you need to have a high concentration of the medication. Otherwise, uh, you're not gonna be able to administer a very big dose. And we'll see some drawbacks to that with uh, the two medications we're gonna talk about uh, specifically here. Now, some situations you do not want to use intranasal drug administration would include things like nasal trauma or if they have like a septal defect, that would be one you probably want to avoid there. And then if they have any kind of recent vasoconstrictor use, so some things like uh, cocaine or phenylephrine, why do you think that is? Not probably receptor down regulation necessarily, but if you think about it, having that vasoconstrictor, um, there's less blood flow happening in there. You're going to have a harder time for those drugs to partition across. Um, so again, that can just like you know I've probably mentioned before, but you know people who snort cocaine, they kind of do themselves a favor because they kind of limit how much they absorb as time goes on because they vasoconstrict those those vessels so much. Same thing goes for, uh, for this, where you might get a limited effect out of the drug, just maybe diminish somewhat. Um, other things you'll see palatability may not taste very good. A lot of these medications that we're administering are meant for to be given intravenous and never meant to be tasted, so that could be an issue. And then uh, we'll see some mucosal irritation as well. Uh, we'll talk about that specifically with midazolam here in a few minutes. So the two I'll discuss here, and again, this is the kind of a bridge version. I'll have more uh, drugs we'll talk about at the actual full thing. If you guys uh, get, you know, what your appetite's on this one, you're like, man, I really want to apply for, you know, go, uh, go to ClinCon just so I can see the rest of this, right? Anyway, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Anyway, these are the two drugs we'll talk about, the naloxone and, and uh, so naloxone, uh, we've uh, probably not covered in class very specifically, we're almost there, but uh, this is going to be our mu opioid receptor antagonist. This is going to be the reversal agent of choice for your opioids, and we use it very widely, both via the intravenous and the uh, intramuscular routes, and you're actually finding more and more uses for other routes of administration for naloxone. So intranasal is becoming one of the big routes, which we'll talk about here, but certainly even nebulized naloxone, where they actually put it into a regular nebulizer cup and the patient can breathe it in passively, is another route we've actually uh, seen some uh, decent use for. And so this is going to be beneficial because it will help to reverse opioid-induced respiratory and CNS depression. And the nice thing with this drug is it's relatively devoid of side effects. The only problem you might run into is if you give too much of the medication, you can put the patient into withdrawal, which they're, again, not going to be very happy about, especially if they were abusing some of these opioids uh, for their euphoric properties. They're going to be kind of mad at you. But, uh, again, if it saves a life, then that's probably going to be uh, a you know, benefit overall. Anywho, the nice thing here is you're going to see that we're starting to give these to more lay people and more first responders. So that way, um, you know, if you don't have the, the medical training to start an IV or to give an intramuscular uh, injection, it's very easy to train people up on how to, to use this. So um, for patients who are at high risk for opioid abuse and, and respiratory depression, they're starting to give naloxone doses out to um, family members. So that way, if they come in and they find their loved one down on the ground, not breathing, they can administer this immediately rather than having to wait for, you know, 911 to respond. All right, so these are things that, you know, again, time is tissue. The faster you can get the, these patients taken care of, the, the better it's going to be for them. As far as um, limitations here, you're going to see that with the IV formulation, the most concentrated that we have is, is one milligram per ml. And so you can really only give a total of two milligrams 
of naloxone, which IV is a pretty standard sort of dose, but may not be enough for, especially some of these more synthetic sort of opioids, may be more difficult to respond to. However, a newer nasal spray is actually uh, in development where they're going to have a four milligrams per 0.1 ml concentration. So this, this nasal spray right here is more concentrated. So that may allow you to administer a bigger dose for these patients uh, and, and get better efficacy out of that. So I decided to look to see kind of what the trends are, especially here locally. And so I found this one article uh, from 2016 uh, about some of the sheriffs being armed with uh, naloxone doses. So they had reported that in 2016, they had 85 heroin overdose deaths in, in, in 2015. Now, of course, that doesn't take into account a lot of prescription ovi uh, opioid overdoses. So that number is probably likely higher that could potentially benefit from this naloxone. And so they decided to go ahead and give uh, naloxone doses to 700 deputies. So that way, when they respond to these cases, they would have training on how to recognize opioid overdose and apply this medication. And so, you know, they found that, you know, in about 30 to 40 percent of cases, EMS was actually, uh, sheriff were responding prior to EMS. And so these are cases where they could potentially benefit from rapid administration of naloxone. And it's not, you know, uh, the most inexpensive drug out there, but these doses were roughly costing around 37.50 per officer that was armed with this. So again, um, of course, if you can, you know, potentially save a life, some people probably consider that you know, pretty cost effective from that standpoint. So the question is, does it work? Do we have evidence to actually support utilizing intranasal uh, naloxone? I apologize if these are a little difficult to read. I tried to make them as big as I could. But uh, here's a couple of studies we have here. This one back in 2005, and it was a prospective non-randomized trial where they had a number of uh, patients who were basically um, EMS were responding to uh, calls for patients who either found down, had a suspected opioid overdose, um, or with altered mental status. And so they were trained on to, uh, you know, immediately upon uh, encountering the patient, they would administer naloxone intranasally, and then they would work to get an IV and then potentially uh, uh, give an IV dose if they needed uh, additional naloxone administration. Now, they gave it to a lot more patients than that, but if you imagine every patient you find down with altered mental status, are all of them going to be opioid overdoses? Probably not. So there's probably a lot of false positives uh, from this case. But of the patients who responded, they had about 52 that actually did respond to naloxone. Out of that bunch, 43 or 83% of them actually responded to intranasal naloxone alone. They didn't actually need any further naloxone dosing. They didn't even need the IV in that case. And so you see that looking at the actual time between initial patient encounter to drug administration, you know, it's about three minutes quicker to give the intranasal dose than it was to actually get the IV started and, and um, administer the drug via that route. So again, there's some time savings there. And then um, looking here at the actual drug administration time, Pretty quick, uh, or actually, this is a uh, time to response from the medication. It's actually pretty similar, you know, 4.2 minutes versus 3.7 with the IV. So again, similar onset, maybe a little bit slower, but tends to be, uh, you know, pretty similarly efficacious as the IV route. So that seemed to be pretty good. Uh, here's another one. This is Merlin et al. in 2010. I checked to see if this was coming from Hogwarts, but it was not. Um, <laughs> It's done like Utah or somewhere. Um, this is actually a retrospective chart review where they were again looking at a kind of uh, a new protocol where they actually were administering um, uh, intranasal naloxone to uh, confirmed opioid overdoses and how they confirmed that we're doing things like, you know, either a patient admitted to uh, using opioids, they had some sort of witness account that they were using it, or they had like paraphernalia around them or positive urine drug screen. So these are how they kind of uh, try to identify only opioid overdoses to find those responders. Instead of looking at to see, you know, uh, the previous study, it was just paramedics saying like, well, did the patient respond? It was kind of nebulous was, and it was very subjective. Here, they're actually looking at changes in respiratory rates and, and uh, Glasgow coma scale. Does it cover GCS before, correct? Okay, so what, what is that? Okay, measuring like their responsiveness, measure, you know, and again, it really is, is meant to, to apply to trauma patients, but they'll, you see it used pretty liberally in lots of other situations. But here you can see that looking at IV naloxone versus intranasal, and these are patients that either received IV or intranasal, you see here that um, looking at the differences between the respiratory rates, see here it started with, you know, an average of 10 in both groups and then increased 18 in the IV group, 16 respiratory rates. So again, similar increases there in, in um uh, respiratory rate and looking at the GCS scores going from four as an average in the IV group to three. Um, and again, that's about as low as you can get. I'm surprised none of these patients got intubated immediately, but um, you know, increased from four to 15, three to 12. So again, pretty similar increases. Uh, and they found no significant or statistically significant differences between these two. And again, a lot of these trials like this, they're trying to show non-inferiority, basically saying that there is no difference. So that way they can say they're pretty much equally efficacious. 
And so uh, from that standpoint, they see that, you know, hey, this appears to be pretty similarly efficacious to the IV. So if you don't have time to get IV or if someone could have given this prior to EMS showing up, this could be potentially very, very useful. So again, it appears to be uh, similar in efficacy to IV naloxone. Um, you might find that intranasal will take a little bit longer to kick in, but again, if this is being given prior to EMS showing up, that might be okay because they would have gotten nothing at that point. Um, and they may have found that patients may require uh, re uh, repeat dosing, either I, uh, I, intranasal, then IV, or multiple intranasal doses, because uh, it may not have as long of a lasting effect, essentially. Um, but again, this is a huge potential for administration by uh, first responders and lay people. So again, huge um, potential out, uh, impacts it could have just on, on general health for these uh, high-risk patients of you know having opioid overdoses. And so there's actually a law that was passed. Uh, I believe it was in 2016. I think this came through. Um, but basically, this was saying that it was giving authorization for providers, and that believe this is referencing uh, physicians specifically. They can write kind of blanket orders to say, hey, here's a prescription for naloxone not with any intention of necessarily using it, but in case you find someone who has an opioid overdose or if you have a high-risk individual, say, living with you, you have this available. So that way, if you're acting in good faith, you can reverse them uh, and then, you know, obviously call 911 and have, have uh, EMS take care of them. But again, this is uh, you know, giving the ability for uh, providers to give out these intranasal doses of naloxone. Pharmacies can fill them and potentially have increased access uh, of this life-saving medication. So I think overall, it's probably going to be a good thing uh, for these patients. Okay. Moving on, um, we have Versed, midazolam. This is a uh, you know, benzodiazepine receptor agonist and enhances that GABA activity. So we have lots of different uses for this one. We have it used as an anxiolytic, sedative, antiepileptic, and I'm gonna focus mainly on the antiepileptic uh, uses here. Um, but we use this quite frequently over at Nemours for uh, anxiolysis. We use it very frequently for uh, you know, prior to procedural sedation, prior to laceration repairs, IV sticks, all sorts of things in order to help kind of chill these kids out a little bit and get them ready for whatever procedure they need. Um, and so we have a lot of experience with this, but I was curious to see like how good is it compared to something like rectal diazepam, which is kind of the gold standard for pre-hospital management of, uh, of seizures. If there's any uh, data out there. Just in general, though, looking at an IV dose versus an intranasal dose, you typically will see higher dosing for the intranasal because, again, you're not having 100% bioavailability. You still have to have that absorption actually occur there, so it won't be 100%. Shoot a little bit higher doses. And this is actually one we run into some issues where uh, the max concentration we have is 5 milligrams per ml. So we, you know, giving one ml um, in each nostril, you only get a max of 10 milligrams. And that may not be enough in, in some patients, especially larger children, uh, adolescents, adult patients. So you may need to have a repeat dose uh, ready for that. Um, the other big thing, with, uh, big thing with midazolam is the pH is pretty low. It's about less than four, uh, which means pretty acidic, and it can be uh, sting quite a bit when you uh, spray that into the nostril. Um, so, you know, 66% of patients will, you know, report bitter taste and stinging. Uh, and so some places will actually give five minutes prior to the Versed, they will give a little shot of uh, uh, lidocaine, nasal spray, and that will help to kind of numb things up a little bit, and you won't get that stinging sensation quite so much. So, um, and the thing here with a lot of the data that we're seeing, a lot of it is based on pediatric data and extrapolated to adults, um, not as much actual adult data. So similarly, you can't say that, you know, kids are just little adults. You just can't say uh, adults are big kids, although some of us probably act that way. But uh, again, we take some, uh, take it with a grain of salt there. Anyway, so uh, in the case of using it as an anti-epileptic or pre-hospital setting, um, you know, we wanted to see how does it compare with diastat or rectal uh, diazepam, because this is very frequently what uh, patients are being prescribed, so that way a caregiver can administer it on the onset of seizures. And just to look at the cost here, you can see that there's a huge difference because uh, di rectal diazepam is about $371 a dose versus just 12 bucks for a dose of uh, you know the intravenous formulation of Versed. So huge cost savings are potential here. And also uh, the rectal administration can be difficult to um, do. You know you have to you know strip them down basically and administer the drug versus this you can just shoot it up their nose essentially. And so actually, if you look at the American Epilepsy Society uh, guidelines, they actually list this as a you know, level B recommendation uh, as an option for this kind of pre-hospital care for these seizures to administer intranasal Versed. So just one study here that we were looking at, um, basically it was a pre-post study where they had kind of pre-protocol uh, set up to administer diazepam versus post uh, uh, 
kind of a post period where they're using intranasal Versed, and they were looking at um, you know, 39 patients with intranasal uh, midazolam versus 18 with prorectal uh, diazepam. And what they actually found was that the actual median seizure time witnessed by EMS was actually reduced uh, pretty significantly. This was statistically significant. 11 minutes for patients receiving Versed versus uh, 30 minutes for patients with diazepam. That's a pretty significant amount of time that they were not seizing uh, when they received the midazolam. Other things they found that patients that got the diazepam were more likely to get intubated and more likely to be admitted to the ICU, um, more likely to require more medications. So again, actually, this is one of those cases where not only are we showing non-inferiority, but we're also showing that maybe this might be superior to rectal uh, diazepam. And you can see some of the um, some confidence intervals that are associated with that. I won't kind of bore you with these details. Just take my word for it. <laughs> You always have a skeptical eye whenever someone says that. Um, but this does appear to be uh, a little bit more efficacious than the actual diazepam. So again, not any worse, and that's kind of what we're looking for. And again, if it's a cheaper option that works just as well, I'd rather do that, right? So anywho, um, you know, current studies appear to support that improved efficacy. And right now, we don't have any studies that are looking at uh, kind of the other gold standard, which is IV lorazepam. So there's nothing to say that intranasal Versed could replace that. However, that is one area that people might want to try studying in, in the future. Um, and actually, uh, anecdotally, we're starting to see that a lot of our neurologists uh, that I work with um, are prescribing intranasal Versed in lieu of giving the, the rectal diazepam. So this is something that you'll probably see in your practice, especially on the PEDS standpoint, you'll, you'll probably see more of this uh, out there. And again, education is really important to make sure the provider or you know, their parents or whoever knows how to administer this appropriately. So um, just a couple other drugs, um, and again, I'll do the, when I do the full talk, we'll be able to talk about the rest of these, but fentanyl is another big one we use in the PEDS ED. We get this very frequently uh, for kind of moderate, mild to moderate pain control. Um, ketamine is another interesting one, especially for getting kids ready for like procedural sedations or MRIs and things like that. And then uh, dexmedetomidine. Anyone heard of dexmedetomidine? Presidex. This is a, uh, an ICU sort of sedative agent, so there's some um, kind of experimental use of this one for, for sedation uh, in the pre-hospital setting as well. So those are kind of future uses um, that we'll you know, talk about in the actual full talk. So anywho, intranasal drugs seem to be pretty good, right? It seems to be a pretty convenient way to administer these medications. They seem to be pretty effective for the most part. And so just the, the ability to be able to train lay people to utilize this route is, is, uh, has a potential huge impact. Uh, and so I think is, is gonna be seen more and more often as time goes on uh, more than anything. So here's some references. And if... All right, I'll play a little more.